interview today will be with Dr. Stephen Britsky. Uh, Dr. Britsky is a professor at the University of Missouri Columbia. And if I understand correctly, you're currently the interim director for the Division of Endocrinology. Is that is that correct? It is. Yes. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, your your current practice and position and what you do? Sure. Um, so I've I've been at MU for uh, 19 years. Uh, by the time anybody views this uh, this program. Um, and it's a second career for me. I, I can go into my first career if we want to do that. But um, I, um, I aspired to be a teacher as well as a patient care doctor. And so I was attracted to a university practice. Um, as it happens, I'm an alum of the University of Missouri. So when they were posting an opening in my specialty when I was looking for work, it was a good match. And so I do I do regularly work with learners at all levels. So I have um, medical students, uh, residents from several different specialties, and then our subspecialty trainees in endocrinology that I regularly um, interface with. So what what what, uh, what is your practice like? How much of it is outpatient? And so my outpatient? my practice is predominantly outpatient. Um, I did. I am coming off a weekend where I was the the inpatient coverage rounding with one of our fellows. So we do that once in every so many weekends. Um, but Monday through Friday, I'm a patient care doctor and a teacher. I normally have um, about seven clinics per week, seven four hour clinic blocks. So I'm pretty heavily engaged. In patient care, but I like to feel like I'm at least um, least equally engaged in uh, teaching and learning. How did you end up choosing your field of endeavor? How did you end up? Uh, and maybe this is the time for that original career story. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I was so a true confessional here. I was a latecomer to endocrinology, so I'll, I said I was going to look for an excuse to to go back to the very beginning and, and where it began. So my first career was um, something of an accidental career. I spent 20 years in the Air Force paying off a four-year obligation. So I, I always tell people when I introduce that part of my background, I'm obviously a slow learner because I took 20 years to pay off a four-year commitment. But that's what got me into medical education. Um, and I would say that what attracts me to teaching and learning is the same thing that got me into endocrinology. I discovered during three years that I worked as a general internist that one of the daily activities that I enjoyed the most was engaging with patients who had diabetes. Um, and I felt that residency had given me a starting point, but you know, that I was very much a neophyte when it came to counseling patients about diet and activity and um, making sense out of blood sugar data and coaching them towards changes in, in treatment regimens. And, and so I wanted more on that. I wanted to, to focus more on that. Um, I think diabetes is, is kind of the prototype uh, teacher learner disease because what we really what our modern care of diabetes revolves around is an empowered patient. Um, we, 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 we have to uh, impart some wisdom to the patients and let them make day-to-day -day adjustments uh, based on things that they see and do because you know, the, the patient spends 360 days a year without me uh, in a good year and maybe, maybe part of four days a year with me. So what are the what are the good things and the bad things about your practice? What are the, what are the pros and cons as you see it? So the the pros always involve good patients and and interacting with good learners. Um, and I, I think one of the pleasures of being a physician is you you never know uh, when you wake up in the morning exactly how the day is going to unfold. I would say it rarely it rarely ends the way you think it will. Um, and you know that, and that can obviously be both for good reasons and for bad reasons some of the time. But there, there aren't very many things in life, I think, where you can say that on any given day, you might see something that that you've never seen before, and maybe that anyone's ever seen before. So the chance to make an original observation or an original association is probably 
as great or greater in medicine than in anything else that we can do. Um, so the good things about my day usually usually revolve around good encounters with patients. And I'd say what, what makes for that, somebody that I have a personal connection with, somebody that I've seen for a series of visits, or somebody who right off the bat, I can strike up uh, uh, you know, a conversation around something that we have in common outside of medicine, in addition to the disease that brings us together. So I'm always interested in what people do. I think one of the things um, about me and medicine is that I get a chance to learn from patients some things other than medicine. You know, I learn about careers and, and, and hobbies that I don't personally do or haven't thought about. And uh, sometimes patients can turn me on to those things. So that's kind of cool. Um, some of the time the hobby and the work um, represent a springboard to doing better diabetes care. And Sorry. probably you can insert the name of any other disease that you might be caring for, but that's so you, what I'm doing most of the time. So you said nothing, you said nothing but good things. Is that because endocrinology is the best field in the world or because of your... I think, I think it was a great choice for me <laughs> and I, I would dare say, you know, who, who does it fit? Um, it, it fits somebody who's willing to sacrifice some monetary income for a very comfortable lifestyle um, and one that revolves around talking to patients. I mean, that's what, what, what I learned about myself in internal medicine residency and in three years as a general internist was that I was a lot better at listening and counseling and reacting to things that people tell me than I was to doing procedures. Um, I, I, I would score myself as uh, probably a bottom feeder when it comes to procedural medicine. And I, I kind of reached a point where I didn't think it would be ethically proper for me to continue marketing myself as a procedurist. So I, in part, I track that way. Partly it's, you know, it's love of the subject matter and the kinds of conversations that spring up around um, diabetes. You know, is, is there a dark side to what I do or are there are aspects of my, uh, my work that I, that I don't like? I'm, absolutely. I, I don't think anyone in 2021 would tell you that they love dealing with prior authorizations um, or that they love dealing. I, I think probably the thing that I dislike the most about the, any job that I've had is time pressure in the job, you know, knowing that we schedule more patients than we can comfortably see, you know, so that, that actually being able to let a visit unfold at a timing uh, to my liking and to the liking of the patient and seeing everybody on time and finishing on, on, on time that it just doesn't happen. I think we, we choose how we're going to spend our time and we, we often sacrifice the temporal aspect of medicine to, uh, to try to be of help to people, but that, that leads to some people being happier than others. Seeing unhappy patients is not a, is not a, good, uh, a good thing either. I mean, that's that's a downer for me personally. I like for people to be happy and 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 to feel that they're making uh, making progress in their lives. Do the, do the stresses uh, that you mentioned ever cause you to, you know, feel like you're on the verge of burnout or feeling burnt out at any point? Um, yeah, I mean, that's something that we devote a lot of talk to and, and a lot of soul searching to. And so I have to, I have to, in a way, feel like I'm on stage when I'm projecting that because as, as we identified up front, I am a, a division director at the moment. So I'm, I lead a group of colleagues and I, I don't think anybody wants to see their leader holding himself up as an example of burnout. But that being said, um, there are a lot of stress forces in medicine, mostly external to the things that I've talked about that are the, you know, why I did what I did and why I keep coming back for more. Um, Do you get enough vacation and, and how much vacation is enough? Um, I, I don't know how much is enough, but uh, I think what we what we get. I work for the University of Missouri, so what I get, I think, is relatively standard. It's thirty paid days per year, and I, I think generally that is um, that's about 
what I need, and I often, frankly, more than I take. Um, a lot when I when I get up to four weeks, I'm usually doing some staycation things that involves things that I don't enjoy around the house, you know, like honeydew projects. Yeah. That's one reason a lot of doctors stay in the workforce as long as they do, I think. I, I, I think that's a good, medicine's a lifetime career. And I, I think um, one thing to maybe reflect on a little bit is the, what's the essential difference between a profession and, and a job? And I, I have, the way I have dumbed it down over the years is a job is something you do, a profession is something that you are. Um, you know, it permeates all aspects of your life. And I, I don't think, there, there's really not a moment of the day where I don't think of myself as, as being a physician. I mean, I'm a physician with a lot of other interests, but um, um, both temperamentally and conversationally, I think I, I never completely shed the stethoscope. So you mentioned that, you, you know, that uh, being an academic endocrinologist involves trade-offs, and one of those is is money. Uh, do you feel that you're fairly compensated? Is, is that an issue for you? I, I do. I mean, because what I'll say is this. Um, I never imagined that I would be making the salary that I make now when I was planning my life almost 40 years ago. Uh, now, obviously, some of that is inflation. Um, but um, I, I think uh, if you look at all the helping professions that a person, you know, and there I'm, I think of um, pastoral ministry, um, nursing, um, you know, social work, probably could, could name some other things. But as physicians, we're compensated better than any other helping profession, I think. And so I think that is, that's something that we should always think about. When, I, when I'm feeling really dejected and, and depressed or unhappy about things, kind of going back to the burnout question for a minute, one of the things that I reflect on is if I weren't doing this, what would I have done different? And I've never been able to substitute anything else for what I've chosen to do. So if, you know, uh, for, for people that might be contemplating an academic career, uh, you know, when you made the transition from the military to um, the university, in retrospect, are there any things that you wish you'd known or known to ask uh, when you took that first job? Um, so I feel like I got a lot of good coaching and I was able to use my Air Force career as a, as a learning ground. So over the over my 20 year career, I networked with colleagues that had gone out and, you know, left the service and gone into practice jobs. So I feel like I learned from them some things to to look for. Um, and so I sort of had my own my own formulas for what I was interested in. Number one is just a sense of of belonging, uh, and that that involves kin feeling a sense of kinship with the colleagues that you're going to be working with. I can usually tell within the first few minutes of meeting a person whether it's somebody that I want to spend more time with, or less time with, or ideally not at all. Um, and I and I went on job interviews where I had that vibe, and so I didn't you know, I didn't get seriously interested in those um, in those practices. Too much emphasis on contracts and um, legalities, it, to me, sends a signal that people don't trust each other. So while contracts are really important, and yes, I think it's a fabulous idea to have a lawyer friend look over a, a contract. Um, if if your prospective physician employers are obsessing over the contract, it probably means there's something wrong with it. And I think the other thing, the other obvious thing that you can look at is, um, and that I looked at is what's the history of your predecessors? You know, in other words, why is there an opening? Best reason of all is you've got a growing practice or a practice with growth opportunities and they're looking to expand. If they're constantly replacing people, uh, you know, who are not old, um, then that suggests that there may be a problem with the job, you know, with the position itself. 
Any other red flags? red flags that I look for? And, and so I think that probably answers the question. I was going to ask if there are any other red flags, but it sounds like that covers it for you. Is that correct? Well, I think um, I, I, I would say in, in an interview setting, um, if people are highlighting call schedules and, you know, we're, we're told, by the way, not to ask, it's a good idea not to ask about compensation and um, call schedules as part of your preliminary interview. Let, let that come later. A lot of the time those things are advertised. If people are volunteering that type of information right up front, it means they're running out of more meaningful things to talk about, I think. But it also means they're trying, they're, they're maybe engaging in a desperate ploy to get people on board. So I'd be, I would be careful with that. Um, probably, you know, I think maybe looking at a professional, uh, professional position or job opportunity is similar to buying a home. They always say, don't buy the cheapest or the most expensive house on the block. I think that's probably good advice for looking for physician jobs as well. So I, I'm, I, I don't think I'm interviewing anybody else who, who's uh, a military position. And uh, with your experience, uh, do you have any advice for people who are thinking about, you know, spending part or all of a career in military medicine? Yeah, I, and I have to preface it by saying that my career was extremely atypical in that I never served on it. I mean, I was certainly ready to go on many occasions, but I never served on a deployment, um, was never in a war zone and was never overseas. Actually, my overseas travel has all come after I got out of the out of the Air Force. Um, with that as, uh, but many of my colleagues who've done deployments say that it was a fabulous experience um, and they liked nation building and engaging with local populations outside the U.S. And um, I, I think it, I think the military offers a lot of growth opportunities. Um, one of the selling points to me is the opportunity to have leadership positions at an early stage of your career. And that, that certainly, if you decide to lead the service, leads to you being a more competitive applicant for a position. If you've been a clinic director or a director of hospital services, something like that, you know, something roughly the equivalent of a chief medical officer. Um, if you're looking at leadership job or program director, or a department chair that makes you more competitive if you're looking for those kind of positions later on. Um, I also think one of the things that is uh, that I think almost anybody that served in a military organization would say is that you the teamwork aspect is better than anything that you're going to encounter anywhere else. I kind of took that for granted when I was in the Air Force and I almost um, I long for that on many occasions in my current position. People lean on each other when, you know, when, when there is a possibility that life and death depends on it. So, um, I, I mean, I love my job in the Air Force. I, uh, that's what got, I was a program director for an Air Force internal medicine residency. Um, I taught for six years at the Uniformed Services University, which is the DOD medical school. Um, so my jobs, the, especially the last three fourths of my career, really centered around education, and that's what I'm doing now. So it it was it was a good segue. Did you did you give any thought to, to finishing your career? I know I know some people who've had um, you know pretty stellar careers in military medical education, like Lou Pangaro and others. Mm -hmm. uh, did you did you give any thought to doing that, or is it? Really well, I, I mean, I did spend 20 years, which is literally a military career. So I, I'm retired, uh, retired as a, as a full colonel in 06, which is a good, a good rank. Um, I could have served longer. I didn't give much thought to it because my thought all along had been to have two careers. I see. Okay. So, so um, you know, for kids that are coming along now, you know, people that are finishing their residency, you know, what do, you, what do you see as the changes in the landscape that they're going to have to deal with that maybe we didn't have to, things that may impact on their career? If you're advising them, what would you tell them you think about the future? Um, 
So, well, a lot, I mean, the future is happening all around us. So without too much of a crystal ball, I think where we are is we, we definitely are deeply engaged in the automation of medicine. I mean, computers are a daily fact of life for, for everything that we do from prescription. We, we don't write prescriptions anymore. And I think most pharmacists would say that's a good thing because they really couldn't read our writing a lot of the time. So computers probably prevent some prescribing errors that way. Um, daily notes, um, you know, the all the workflow that we do that involves charting and documentation involves computers. One of the things that I see in the in the medical students, even not just the residents and the fellows, is that they have been brought up in that world, whereas you and I learned it, you know, at a later stage in our career. I've heard that referred that term um, that term is sometimes expressed as digital novices versus you know, digital uh, indigenous people, digitally speaking, the kids of younger people have grown up, you know, have never known a time when they didn't have computers or uh, tablets or smartphones. And so, whereas I have to still think about doing a lot of those, those things, the, the students and residents do them instinctively. So I think they're, they have a leg up on, on the old farts. They can teach us. Um, if the push comes to shove, you can always show them your cursive writing and tell them about your eight yeah. tapes. Be, beyond, you know, beyond that, I think um, I think that there is definitely more emphasis on um, metrics in medicine. Very popular thing. I don't I don't remember being taught about metrics when I was a resident and a young physician. Um, you know, that is measurable things in a measurable trends in a practice, like what percent of your patients attain their glucose control goals, et cetera, what percent of your patients are doing, are, are using continuous glucose monitors, just to name a couple of things of the moment that we can measure in a practice. The idea of doing something like that 40 years ago um, would have been very obscure to most physicians. So I think I think students and residents now are growing up with a quality improvement mindset. Again, things that we learned, they're growing up with, and and it's more instinctive. Um, I think that there uh, there is more emphasis on care teams in the modern era as compared to when I started. The physician, you know, when I started in my career, I think possibly you experienced something similar. The physician was expected to triumph over a flawed system back at a certain point in time. I mean, there was no such thing as system error. It was, you know, you either caught a mistake or you were recalcitrant for not doing it. And I think that is very different now. We we do systems analyses almost any time there's a there's a less than desirable outcome. And that's probably healthier. Um, the flip side of that is I think that we've lost a little bit of individual accountability over the years that was actually a good thing for the medical profession. So I'd like to, I'd like to challenge that to be restored or preserved as the case may be going forward. Um, I think another thing that is not as it's not as easy to do now because our schedules are so busy, but I just look at the flow in the academic center. Morning report and grand rounds used to be a mandatory attendance event for the entire department. So faculty and, and resident alike were at those conferences, or you had a darn good reason not to be there. Now, uh, even before the pandemic, uh, a lot of people would watch those events remotely, if at all. We schedule clinics during morning report time. And so I, th I think one of the things that we have lost and struggle to restore is a sense of camaraderie and uh, dialogue with our colleagues in medicine, you know, just I, I used to love the, the banter between subspecialists at Morning Report. I always felt I got something out of that. 
even at an advanced stage of my career when I was a program director or a, a subspecialty director. And I think we have lost a lot of the crosstalk between specialists in medicine. And I think that that's influencing career choices. Um, most of our graduates from Mizzou, if they don't go into a subspecialty, uh, I'm talking about residency graduates, most of them become hospitalists. And I'm convinced it's largely because that's the world they know. That's where they spend a lot of time. They're, that's their comfort zone. And we need people to get comfortable in the ambulatory environment because there's a lot of patients that want to be seen effectively in clinics by good internists. Thank you. Are there, are there any things that I...